Praise the Lord. Welcome to Bible study. We are pleased to have you with us. We're studying 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and we're talking a little bit about the gifts of the Spirit. Now, we're going to get into talking a little bit about some sign gifts today. And before we do that, before we continue in our passage here in 1 Corinthians 12, I want us to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 1 just for a minute, because this is very, very important. This is something that we really need to understand when we are talking about signs. 1 Corinthians 1 verse 22 says, For the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. We absolutely have to understand this. This is fundamental so that we don't get into apostasy and teach heresy. Apostolic signs were to the Jews. Very important. Remember, it goes all the way back to the beginning. Remember uh, with Moses. And people were wondering, should we be following this guy, Moses? And God had to do a sign to convince the Jews, yes, this is something that is of God. So what happened? He put his hand in, uh, brought it out, it was leprous. He put his hand in, brought it out, it was healed. That was a sign. And so the Jews need the sign. The Jews absolutely need the sign. We today in the church age, we're Gentiles. We need to seek after wisdom. And we have the wisdom of God. We have it in this book. Now remember... Back uh, when Paul was writing this, they didn't have a complete New Testament. They couldn't pick up the Bible. Well, they could pick up the Old Testament, the, uh, but they couldn't pick up the New Testament and see, hmm, is this of God or not? Um, does this line up with what God's Word says? No, they needed signs so that they knew that this was of God. This was something that we need to follow. And so that's absolutely foundational. That is absolutely important. Um, there are denominations in Christianity that believe that these signs are perpetual and they still operate today. Um, Pentecostals and Charismatics, uh, they tend to uh, believe in the continuation of the gifts of the Spirit. But we as Bible believers, we as um, Baptists and fundamentalists, we don't believe that they're necessary today. We believe that those gifts were for a specific time, for a specific purpose, for a specific people. And then once God started going to Gentiles and, and uh, uh, the gospel started to be preached among Gentiles and they started to get saved, the signs for the Jews were no longer needed. They were obsolete and that does not mean that some of these things can't still happen. But we're going to talk about that in just a moment. Let's uh, reread verse 9. To an, and this is talking about the gifts of the Spirit and how it's all by the same Spirit. It's all by God and God, uh, God's Spirit that dwells within us. But verse 9 says, To another faith by the same Spirit. Now we talked last week about faith. We talked about um how we start off with saving faith, how everybody has been given faith. Everybody has the ability to believe the gospel and trust the gospel by faith. God has given every man a measure of faith. Now, not everybody uses that faith. Not everybody puts that faith in the gospel, and instead they put their faith in other things. Idols, mostly. If you're not worshiping the Lord... The one true God, you are worshiping an idol, and behind every idol is a demon. We know that. So we talked about faith, and we talked about growing faith, and how faith needs to grow and develop, and that doesn't happen overnight. It, it happens by walking in the Spirit. It happens by reading the Scriptures and growing uh, in our walk with the Lord. But the rest of this verse says, to another, the gifts of healing by the same Spirit. Now, I've been accused of, oh, you don't believe in the apostolic sign gifts anymore. Um, See, so why do you even bother praying for healing? You know, you've prayed for uh, different people in the ministry and, and uh, in church service that we have. We've prayed for people that have sent in requests and I've talked and, and testified to healings that have taken place, that God has healed. Absolutely, we believe in healing. 
There's not a single person in the Baptist church that will say, no, God can't heal anymore. Absolutely God can heal. But God does not give people the gift of healing anymore in, in the way where they can lay their hand on somebody and they can be healed. Remember what happened in the Gospels. What did Jesus do? Jesus went out and in his ministry, he laid hands on people, he healed them. And we see in some of the early book of Acts and some of the early church, some of the apostles were healing. Um, and, and God had given them the ability to heal people by laying their hands on them. Now, we do not believe that ha that happens anymore, but there's a lot of quote unquote faith healers out there. Benny Hinn and, and people like that where, um, oh yeah, I lay my hands on people and they are healed. Now notice how it's always invisible. You, you, you never see a person with a, who's an amputee. God, Benny Hinn lays his hand upon them and they grow their limb back or anything like that. It's always something you can't see. Well, if people had the gifts of healing, if people had the gift of healing where they could lay their hand on somebody, why are they not going to the hospitals and clearing them out? Why are people sick today? Why do people die today? If people have the gift of healing where they could lay their hand on somebody and they would be healed miraculously at that moment, why are they not in the hospitals clearing those hospital wards out? That's what I wonder. Because God doesn't give people the gift of healing anymore. Now, God still heals. That's why we pray for healing. That's why we can testify of healing. Absolutely, God can heal miraculously. But God does not give a person the gift of healing where they lay their hand and the, and the healing happens. The healing must come from God. Verse 10. To another, the working of miracles... Now, there were miracles that took place um, in the Gospels. Jesus performed miracles, not just healings. He performed other miracles, like, for example, turning water into wine, um, the, the loaves and the fishes, and how God made a big meal out of, out of a couple of little things. Um, those were miracles that took place, and I do believe that in the early church, uh, there were miracles that were happening. And I believe that miracles can still happen today. But we don't have the ability to do that because God's given us the ability to do miracles. All the miracles come from God. There are miracles that happen all around us. I've prayed and those, some of those prayers have been answered and I can praise the Lord for that. Miracles do happen. Miracles can absolutely happen today and they do happen today. But God doesn't give me the ability to perform a miracle like he once did in the early church where miracles could happen. Remember, the Jews require the sign. The Jews need to see. But we as Gentiles, we walk by faith and not by sight, Paul tells us. And so we should not be looking for experiences we should not be looking for signs and wonders. We should be walking by faith. So to another, the working of miracles, to another, prophecy. Now, prophecy is speaking a revelation of God. And I believe that Paul, while he was writing these uh, epistles that are now part of our New Testament, I believe Paul was prophesying as he wrote. And I believe, you, you can look back in the Old Testament, there were major prophets, there were minor prophets. I studied those in Bible school about the major and the minor prophets. And, and there was a lot of foretelling of things that would happen. You look at Daniel and, and the dreams that, that were happening there. And, and Nebuchadnezzar with the dreams and the statue. All of those types of things. You can look at Isaiah who prophesied 700 to a thousand years before Jesus was even born, about the coming of the Messiah and uh, the circumstances surrounding that. You can look at passages in Isaiah, and there's a couple of passages in Jeremiah as well that talk about that. Um, there were prophecies, and prophecies were big things. 
Now, you need to remember that when this was written by Paul, people were speaking by revelation of God. We don't need to do this today because we have a complete Bible. When Paul was writing the Bible, they had the Old Testament, but the New Testament wasn't there. It wasn't complete. It wasn't compiled like we have today where you can go to a bookstore or go on KJV store or church Bible publishers or whatever and order a Bible. Um, you, you, you had the Old Testament, but you didn't have the complete New Testament. And so they needed these signs. They needed these prophecies. They needed these things to happen so that the people would know, wow, yes, this is of God because only God could do this. But now we have the word of God. And so we have the complete Bible where we can say, hmm, does that line up with scripture? Does that, what's going on in that church that they claim to be of God is that lined up with the, with the Bible, with what the Scripture teaches? The rightly divided Word of God. And if it's, the answer is no, then we know we need to get away from that. We need to throw that out. That's heresy. That's apostasy. And there is a lot of apostasy in Christianity today. A lot of the major cults have come out in the last 200 years. I believe that we are at the very end of the church age, and, and the Bible says that there would be a great falling away before uh, the rapture, before the coming of the Antichrist, the tribulation period, uh, there was going to be a lot of apostasy. And when we look around at Christianity and, uh, and like progressive Christianity and all types of, of things like that, people have really fallen away. Um, so verse 10, to another the working of miracles, we talk about that. To another prophecy, we talk about that. To another discerning of spirits. Again, they didn't have a, new, a whole complete New Testament. And so there were things going on in the Spirit that really, hmm, is that of God or is that something counterfeit? Is that something the devil is doing? You know, the devil is a good counterfeiter. The devil can take what God uh, uh, has done and, and some of the things that God has done, and he can counterfeit that. And in fact, that's going to be a big thing in the tribulation period. With the Antichrist, there's going to be signs and wonders again. And, and everybody's going to wonder after the beast. And, and they're going to worship this, this Antichrist as though he's a god. They're, they're going to take the mark of the beast. Um, they're going to worship his image. They're going to have the number of his name and all of those types of things. And so they needed to discern, is this of God or is this not of God? Now, I believe that we can still discern today, but we discern, number one, with the spirit that is within us. You know, if, if we're in a place or in a church service or something where there's some things going on that really aren't uh, of God, we may, maybe get that little feeling where, mm, you know what, this doesn't seem right to me. And we absolutely definitely have the word of God that we need to line up with. Uh, the Bible says, try every spirit to see if they are of God or not. You know, there's a lot of spirituality out there that is absolutely contrary to Christianity. Uh, spirituality, which tries to teach you that you can tap into the spirit world, communicate with dead people, with ghosts, with Ouija boards and mediums and psychics and all of those types of things. And we need to absolutely be uh, away from all that kind of stuff because that is very, very, very Dangerous. We've talked about that before. So discerning of spirits. To another, diverse kinds of tongues. Now, Pentecostals believe that speaking in tongues is speaking gibberish. It's speaking um, a heavenly language. Well, really, there is no heavenly language. Paul said, I speak with the tongue of men and angels. But the tongue of angels, I believe, was Hebrew. Because if you go back to Paul, when he had his encounter with Jesus on the road to Damascus, Jesus was speaking to him in the Hebrew tongue. And I believe that that's very well possible that, that the tongue of angels is Hebrew. Now, does that mean when we get to heaven, we're all going to be speaking Hebrew? I have no idea. It may very well be possible. I'm not going to teach it dogmatically because I don't know, but I, I think it's possible. The language of heaven could very well be Hebrew. Also, let's go to first, or sorry, let's go to um, Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, just for a moment. And when I was in the Pentecostal church, and I spent 
a decade of my life as a teenager and um, as a young man in my early 20s, I spent um, a number of years in the Pentecostal church, and I was very deceived by them. Let's look at Acts chapter 2. And uh, this is where they would, they would read Acts chapter 2, verses 1 to 4. So let's do that. Acts chapter 2, verses 1 to 4. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now the Pentecostals quit reading at verse 4. They quit reading at verse 4. They do not read what follows. Because if you read what follows, you will know that what goes on in Pentecostal churches is absolutely not what speaking in tongues is. They all get around together and they all speak nonsensical mini syllables into the air. And they believe that that is proof that they've received the Holy Ghost. Well, no, the proof that you receive the Holy Ghost is the fact that you're saved. Ephesians 1.13, one of my most favorite verses says, When you trust and you believe in the gospel, you are sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Uh, receiving the Holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit is not something that happens later on. It is something that happens at the very moment you get saved. It's not something you need to seek after salvation and they actually believe, Pentecostals believe, many of them, that salvation is a three-step process. They believe that first you must repent. Second, you must be baptized in Jesus' name. And third, you have to receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. And their evidence, they claim, of that is speaking in other tongues. Now, they get that from Acts 2, verse 38, uh, which is not to us today because... Um, if you look at verse 36, it says, Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Are you in the house of Israel today? No. Then Acts 2.38 does not apply to you. Your gospel for salvation is 1 Corinthians 15, verses 3 and 4, the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, anyway... So um, in Acts 2, we read down to verse 4. Now let's read what the rest of it says, because you'll see that this is not what happens in Pentecostal churches. Verse 5, And there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men of every nation under heaven. So this is these were Jews that were doing this. These were Jews that were seeking the Holy Ghost. They, they, were, they were obeying what... Uh, they were to do, and Jesus said, wait, you know, I'm going to go away, but I'm going to send a comforter, and they were waiting, they were together in one accord, and then this Holy Ghost came down. Uh, verse 6, now when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together, and they were confounded, because that every man heard them speak in his own language. If you underline in your Bible, underline, heard them speak in his own language. And then if you're in a Pentecostal church, ask your pastor what that means. Verse 7. And they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galilean? Verse 8. And now, and how hear we every man in our own tongue? There you go again, underline that. Wherein we were born. And then verses 9 to verse 11 actually lists the language they were spoken. And verse 11 ends with, We do hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God. So what is speaking in tongues? Biblically, correctly, speaking in tongues is you are speaking a language, a real, earthly, written, spoken language on this planet that the people hearing you do not speak. Or sorry, that you're speaking a language to people that don't speak the language that you know. So you are God given you, God has given you the ability to be able to speak the language to people that speak that language. And you don't know it. That's speaking in tongues. Not throwing your hands in the air and making weird nonsense syllables, blah, 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 blah. That is not speaking in tongues. That is probably blasphemy and absolute. Uh, heresy. Uh, 
go back to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. So we talked about we talked about working of miracles, we talked about prophecy, we talked about discerning of spirits, we talked about tongues. Now, what is this interpretation of tongues? Interpretation of tongues is like the opposite of speaking in tongues. It's your hearing in tongues. You're in a church service um, in the early church, very early church. And you don't speak the same language as the preacher. And the preacher is speaking, but you are hearing it in your language, even though that's not the language that they're speaking. That is interpretation. You're able to understand. So, can speaking in tongues happen today? Well, I believe it possibly can. I can't speak Chinese, but if I'm out uh, in Chinatown in Toronto or someplace... And God wants me to share the gospel with somebody who doesn't speak English, only Chinese. And I can't speak Chinese. And God gives me the ability to speak Chinese so that I can share the gospel with them. Then, yes, that's what speaking in tongues is. And that would be the gift of tongues. But I don't think that happens very often anymore. I think it probably could. And I'm sure it probably does. But it's not really the norm today. Um... If you really want the, the gift of speaking in tongues and the gift of interpretation, you could use Google Translate, <laughs> or there's probably some apps for that. So, yes, back in the early church, you know, they, uh, there, there were people that spoke a lot of languages. And in fact, they were listed in Acts 2, verses 6 to 9, those languages that they were speaking. That is speaking in tongues and interpretation of tongues is when the preacher is speaking his language and you don't speak the same language as him, but you're hearing it in your language. That's interpretation. Verse 11, and then we're going to quit. But all these worketh that one and the selfsame spirit dividing to every man that, sorry, dividing to every man severally as he will. So again, this is one spirit. This is all God's spirit. It doesn't matter what gifts God has given you. It doesn't matter. It's all from the same Spirit. It's all from God's Spirit. And when we get saved and we're sealed, that's God's Spirit there. You know, we all have different functions. We all have different roles in the church. We all have different ministries, different talents, different things that we can do for God. But it's all given to us by God, by the same Spirit. So, made it down to verse 11. And we're going to continue next week in verse 12. So until next time, God bless.